All right. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. Thank you. And Big Anklevich. Gesundheit. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield. And this is the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. All right. Yeah, it's been a while, but he managed to remember all four parts of the name. So, uh, I think we're making progress. Yeah, we're here with another episode for you folks. Today's story is called I Zombie. Yes? Yes? That is correct, sir. And it's by Munsey, am I right? By Christopher Monroe. Uh, I don't know if they're two different people. Oh. Never mind. Munsey is the big Frankenstein guy from the <laughs> Adams family, right? No. No, the Mun Munsters is Munzi. Herman Munster? Or Lurch? Oh, shoot. Now I don't even know. Probably Herman well, Munster. Let's just say Christopher Monroe then. Save us a little bit of uh, confusion. Yeah, we'll just go with that since we're not sure which Frankenstein guy he, he really is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Christopher Monroe, you've heard on our show before. Let's see. He did The Devil Went Down to Georgia. What was it? The Devil and <laughs> Michelle Jenkins? Is that what that story was called? The Devil and Miss Jones? <laughs> <laughs> the, what? The J Jenkins? Patty Jenkins directed Wonder Woman? Yeah, that one. No, you remember uh, The Devil and War Michelle Jenkins? There's really... Oh, Death and Michelle Jenkins. D oh, you're right. It was Death, not the Devil. This is almost as bad as my Jiminy Cricket story I told last time. Uh, no, it's okay. not, because that, that one was lost forever. Nobody heard you. Really. Death and Michelle Jenkins was a Christopher Monroe story. Oh, you're story. talking about Il Grillo Parlante. Yes. What? <laughs> Who else? What? Did he do any other stories? Do you remember? He probably he did. He did a triple word score story. Oh, yeah. Michael Jackson, probably. I believe. Was he did Michael Jackson? I believe so. There really? is a weird noise going on outside. Did you hear that? Yeah, uh, sorry, let me interrupt. Uh, last time we recorded, we went to a, a different place than we normally do because we thought it might be quieter. And as we were recording, there was this sound. Can, can you do an impression? Try and recreate it? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we were recording. Something like that, I don't know. I cut out that part, and now I wish that I hadn't. Because it's basically me going, did you, did you, oh, Jesus, what is that? <laughs> I mean, it just went from, like, curiosity to terror in, like, two seconds. It was like the wailing of a lost soul or something like that. And then you said, no, I think that's probably a two-year-old somewhere here in the parking lot at 1.35 in the morning. Yeah, and I thought, was... but a wailing of a lost soul is more likely than a two-year-old. Yeah, it's it's less creepy, I think, too, than a, a two-year-old in an empty parking lot at one thirty in the morning. What the hell? What, um, what are you hearing? No, I'm just saying. I, oh, you were calling back to um, the old days. Yes, that was my reaction to that. Uh, so, yeah, Christopher Monroe has been on here before. Do you remember what Basically, Munzee rhymes with? Point. Munzee rhymes with... Funzy, but yeah, just... what the heck is funzy? That's not a word either. Oh, okay. Munzy, does it rhyme with Fonzie? Because Fonzie is a... Is, so it's not Eddie Munster. <laughs> Eddie Munster, that's who you were thinking of? Okay, Marilyn Munster is who I often Herman think Herman Munster? Uh. I, I think a lot about uh, Marilyn Manson, but not hmm. Marilyn Munster. Interesting. Uh, why, why would that happen? <laughs> Guys, this story is called I Zombie. And I cannot recall the circumstance under which Munzee sent it to us, except I, for that I told him to. I I, I don't know. What do you? How do you remember it? Uh, I want to say it came from when we were saying, "Hey, everybody, you know, we're uh, we're thinking about not doing uh, full cast stories, and we're thinking about letting people produce. If you want to produce for us, let us know." And Munzee said, "I'll give you a story." And you said, all right, or something like that. That doesn't sound like me, does it? No, it doesn't. That's why I am I stopped and said something like that, because that story suddenly, yeah, completely derailed. It's like when you're reading a book and there's a character who's a certain way, and then suddenly, obviously, just to make the plot work, they do something totally out of character to keep it going. 
that's the way you manage to keep the Doomsday Audio Fiction magazine going is by doing something <laughs> totally out of character. The funny thing is, I was on Facebook the other day, and I don't know. Every once in a while, this will pop up. I don't choose for it to pop up, but it pops up. The Doomsday Audio Fiction magazine submissions will reopen sometime in 2012. That's why would oh, okay. I can't wait for then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People used to bug us about that. When are they going to reopen? I think they've finally given up. I'm glad. Although some people, I think, still send things to submissions. Yeah, guys, don't send things to the submissions folder. When would you say the last time was you checked the submissions folder? <sighs> well, I I tried to log into it the other day because you said there was something in there. I don't even know how to. It wouldn't let me. I was completely locked out of it, so I don't think I even can log into submissions anymore, but it's probably at least been a year. Okay. At least. Probably more like two. So, yeah, yes. Don't, don't send something don't there. Don't send stuff there. Every once in a while I look and there are new stories in there. But I, I'm sorry, I don't even read them. After all, it says on our website, submissions are closed. Yeah, at least wait until 2012, guys. Come on. <laughs> Speaking of stories, though, something that I can't ever forgive Munzee for is he writes a story a week and publishes it on his podcast. That's right. On his website. I wish he would stop. But nothing is stopping him. He's unstoppable. Worse than the Terminator. Yeah, and but I, at the same time, I'm a little bit encouraged by that. I, I think it would be great if I could do that. I know I can't. A man's got to know his limitations. But yeah, I mean, if you were thrown into a like pot of molten metal, you would melt. But Munzee would not. He would just climb back out and keep going. And yeah, even the Terminator didn't do that. I think he, he melted but gave the thumbs up before that. <laughs> That's happened. right. Even the other Terminator, he like transformed into a bunch of different things as he melted too. That was pretty rad. That was awesome. Okay, guys. Uh, we're gonna run Unbreakable. What's it called? <laughs> In Zombie. I Zombie is the title of the story. And it's not long, but uh hopefully it's Long on content. Ooh, sorry. That was awful. Like, can, can, shoot, had, we ha haven't had Announcer Man with us in a while. Was it Announcer Man that used to cut the stuff out, or was it the robot? That it was the robot that cut stuff oh, out. Okay. Announcer Man does not know thing number one about how to operate even a computer at all. He still uses a typewriter. And then uh, Xeroxes... <laughs> things off and gives them to people he doesn't even xerox he does like a runoff or a mimeograph or whatever they are <laughs> that you used to get in school where wow. they're like that kind of pale purple sure and then the, the ink is like a darker purple yeah. that's what his i mean you obviously you, you notice when you get the the things in the mail uh usually they come weeks after the episode that we're going to talk about that kind of stuff uh, pertains to but Anyway, sorry I'm rambling. I zombie everybody, enjoy! I zombie by Christopher Monroe. You misunderstand us on a fundamental level. You always have. We know that though you don't seem to. But everyone misunderstood us, still misunderstands us, so there's no reason for you to feel in any way deficient due to this failing of yours. It's a constant, an innate trait shared by all humanity. When we first rose, you panicked, which is both natural and inevitable. I was one of you back then, and as such I know exactly how you felt. How could I not? I felt the same way. The dead were returning, rotting, shambling corpses with no desire other than to feed on the flesh of the living suddenly roamed the land. Of course you panicked. We all panicked. What else could we have done? In those first few days after the dead returned, when it still wasn't too late to mitigate the damage brought upon us by the crisis, we instead washed the world in panic, turning on one another with a ferocity unmatched in human history. We laid blame, slaughtered one another, 
fled our cities and squandered our defenses on crowd control and petty grudges, rather than facing the very real threat to humanity's survival that lay before us. We couldn't face it, so we didn't. And by the time we fully understood the folly of our actions, it was too late. With every desperate, fleeing person trampled in the mad, rushed exodus from a city, with every soldier or civilian killed in one of the wars the death throes of civilization brought with it, the army massed against us grew in numbers, and our own numbers dwindled. By the time we were ready to face the crisis head-on, it was already too late. There was nothing we could do. We were too scattered, too disorganized. There were too few of us surviving to stand against the tide of ravenous dead. So we hid. We hid from the dead, and we hid from one another, imagining that scavengers and looters might take away what little we had left. Imagining that there even were looters in this new world the dead had built for us to live in. We found places we believed we could fortify, or we traveled light enough to be able to run, should the need arise. And we hid. We thought this might protect us. My group did okay. We lasted longer than most, I think. By the time I was bitten by a corpse that had been torn in half by some misfortune or other, and then crawled under the cash register desk of the small town general store I was scavenging supplies from, we hadn't seen another group in weeks. Everyone else was either dead or just as paranoid about their fellow survivors as we were and chose not to make their presence known. Which, again, makes perfect sense. After all, new people can't be vouched for. Nobody knows where new people might have been since mankind's fall, or what they might have been doing. They could be infected, a time bomb waiting to go off. Sure, they'll say they're clean, but desperate people say anything to gain a few more precious hours of life. They're probably safe. And they'll definitely claim they are, but the nagging doubt will always remain, because they could be lying, both to themselves and to anyone willing to listen. I should know. I certainly was. I managed to keep up the pretense that everything was fine for three days, before finally locking myself in the manager's office of the converted Costco warehouse we were using as a fortified encampment. I was shaking and sweating constantly by that point. My skin was pale and waxy. I knew I didn't have long left, but I was still unwilling to relinquish my hold on life, still half believing that my case would be somehow different than that of the billions who'd come before me, that I'd be the one who fought off the disease before it claimed me. I clung to my delusions, even as my friends banged on the office door, begging me to open up, to let them humanely cave my skull in with a crowbar so as to conserve ammunition, or at least to surrender my rifle back to them, as I wouldn't be needing it once I turned. I did no such thing. I still needed my rifle, in case I pulled through. They didn't know I wouldn't pull through, not for certain. Just because nobody we knew had survived the infection, that didn't mean there were no survivors. We just hadn't met them yet, or seen them, or heard anything about them, or met anyone who had. But no disease kills 100% of its sufferers, and even if the percentage that survived this one was minuscule, they couldn't know for sure that I wouldn't be among the lucky few. I tried to explain this to them but they either couldn't or wouldn't appreciate the wisdom of my carefully constructed arguments. The fact that by then my tongue had swollen to the point that the simple act of speech was nearly impossible may have contributed somewhat to their reaction. Still, when I put a bullet into the door as they were trying to break in, they got my meaning clear enough. They abandoned the Costco a few hours later. It had only ever been meant as a temporary refuge, anyway. I suppose this was for the best, as it turned out I was not among the tiny, lucky, entirely hypothetical percentage, but rather the overwhelming, unlucky one which died, then rose, 
then slouched forward, searching for living human beings to consume. And from the time I got out of the office, about three weeks after my death, that's what I've been doing, searching, searching, wandering, seeking any man or woman with a heartbeat to sate myself upon. Until today I'd not found any. As I said, my group lasted longer than most after the fall, and there aren't many living people left. But that's okay. I can be very patient when I need to be. And at any rate, it's not as though I'm hungry. That's the part you misunderstand, you see. We aren't trying to satisfy our terrible hunger. And we aren't hungry for the taste of human flesh. How could we be? We're dead, and the dead know no hunger. We aren't capable of metabolizing meat. We don't require the nutrients or the protein. We can't even taste what's put in our mouths. I'm not even sure I can properly remember food, and the concept of eating, either for pleasure or sustenance, now seems bizarre to me. Which you could, had you stopped to consider it seriously at any point, have been able to figure out on your own. We're dead. Dead flesh hangs from our bones, rotting before your eyes. We don't heal from wounds. If you prick us, we do not bleed. How on earth would we transport necessary nutrients from that which we consume to the parts of our bodies that need them? How, looking at us and seeing an animated but clearly very dead body, could you possibly believe that words like eating or hunger could reasonably apply. But you do. It's the only reference point you know, I suppose, and the very instinct that led to the collapse of Western civilization and near extinction of humanity. Even knowing us as you now do, after all you've been through, you insist on speaking of us in human terms, as though we were simply different, but still functioning things with different but still functioning metabolisms. Which is ridiculous. We're beyond that, simultaneously above and beneath it. It simply no longer applies in our case. I could happily go on until the last of the flesh dropped from my bones without ever eating another bite, and I'd barely notice the difference. There'd be no craving, no hunger. I would simply be, and be happy to do so because hunger has never been what this was about. We don't eat the living because we're hungry. We hate you. We hate your still warm bodies and your still beating hearts. We hate how you can glide so effortlessly across the room, propelled by unspoiled limbs, commanded by still fully functioning brains as you go. We hate your life, your vitality, because... We so vividly remember. We remember what it was like to be alive, how strong and pure we were, and we profoundly regret never having taken the time to appreciate what we had with every lurching, stumbling step we now take. We remember our deaths, how small and frightened and helpless we felt, and how we would have given anything for a few more minutes, for a few more seconds— for one more breath. And we remember how, before we were bitten, we'd allowed pointless, trivial minutia weigh us down, draw our focus, and prevent us from really understanding the value of what we had. Of life. We hate you because we see ourselves in you. And we hate the injustice of it that you might still enjoy your warm, living flesh, might still take some measure of comfort in every breath your functional lungs draw, when all such comfort has been stripped from us forever. I've done nothing to deserve this existence. Nothing. I'm a good person. Or at least I used to be. We were all good people and some random, cruel twist of fate stripped us of everything, of our lives, and even of rest once our lives were done. 
while you go on enjoying all that we've lost. Of course we hate you. If you could see yourselves as we do, you'd hate you too. And hate is a power all of its own. It's not as clean as life. It's not as simple. It's not as pretty. But it can serve if called upon. It can propel you forward, even when there's very little of you left to propel. Hate keeps us moving. Hate and, if I have to be honest, fear. Because some small part of me still is that little frightened man barricaded inside that Costco office, hoping beyond hope that my case might somehow be different. I still hope that, on some level. I'm too afraid not to. It's a combination, then, of emotions that keeps my corpse upright. Fear prevents me from laying down and accepting that this truly is the end for me. And hate keeps me focused on you. When I followed your convoy through town, it was my hate that gave my legs the strength they needed to keep up with you. You weren't driving fast, but you went far enough that living legs would have tired before you stopped. When you stopped at the same mom-and-pop store where I was bitten, it was hate that let me step over the corpse that had bitten me a lifetime ago without a thought, in my pursuit of my real prey. I could have stopped to take revenge, but what would the point have been? It only would have alerted you to my presence, and we were both already dead, so it seemed petulant to hold a grudge. It was hate that led me to follow you when you split off from your group to explore the battery aisle and, once you were out of earshot, to take a bite out of your arm before you managed to push me away and lock yourself in the store's public restroom. You think I'm waiting for you to come out so I can sate my hunger with your succulent flesh. Were I hungry, I probably would. But as I said, I'm beyond hunger now, and I need no flesh. No, I'm not waiting for you to come out. I know you'll never open that door as long as I'm here. I felt the same fear when I realized I was infected. My mind raced as I desperately tried to think my way out of the impossible position I'd suddenly found myself trapped within. It doesn't cause me to hate you any less. But rest assured, I do understand what you're going through. You'll wait for me to wander away, convince yourself that you were lucky, that something distracted me, and then you'll rejoin your convoy as they continue looting supplies. You'll torture yourself with the knowledge that you should tell them you were bitten, you should let them crush your skull, because every moment from now on you put the people around you in danger. But you'll rationalize. You'll tell yourself what you want to hear. And in the end, you'll tell them nothing of what happened. You'll just keep on, infected, for as long as it takes for whatever it is that caused the dead to rise to sap you of your life. Maybe you'll last longer than I did. Maybe you'll manage to take one or two of your still-living friends with you before they finally put you down like some mad, dangerous beast. Maybe. I have no idea. Because that's not my story. It's yours. By the time it happens, you'll be far from here. You'll have found a place you think you can fortify to sleep for the night, or you'll have moved on to the next town, and I'll stay behind to wait for the next group of survivors. It doesn't matter, though, that I won't see your story through to its end, because I know I've played my part, and played it well. I've brought you down to my level, made you like myself, and now there's no longer any reason to hate you, and it feels like a weight's been lifted from my shoulders. Not that my shoulders are in any shape to bear weight. Ah, I know you don't understand any of what I'm saying, even as I'm saying it to you. I don't really have vocal cords anymore, and my jaw doesn't work the way it once did. So all you're hearing is a series of low moans. Even if I could properly articulate my thoughts, I doubt that you, huddled in the bathroom, weeping as you are, 
would be paying enough attention to me to follow my line of thought. I understand that. I really do. It's just that the misconception that we hunger is something that's bugged me since the day I died, and I thought I ought to point the mistake in the premise out to someone, even if that someone happens not to be listening. I wanted to tell you how I felt, even if you don't understand my point. Which you don't. And that's okay. Because soon you will. Author's note. Manzi, I'm going to take your little tail off your... No, that's you. I guess it must be an attachment. It's a recorded one. Really? I believe so. That's what the little speaker with the thing coming off of it means, right? we can listen to it together. Sometimes a story gets away from you as you're writing it. I, Zombie, started as a monologue for a monthly spoken word open mic I do locally. I thought it would be cute to tell a zombie story from the point of view of the zombie. But as I got to the meat of the piece, I realized that what I'd meant to be a three-minute monologue was already nearly a thousand words, with no end in sight. And rather than restructuring it or cutting it back, I just kept going, as I wanted to see where it went. Obviously, it never got performed. The open mic in question does have a time limit, and I do want to be invited back, and a 2,500-word story is too long by a roughly 2,100 words. Instead, I handed it to a friend who was attempting to launch a new fiction podcast, and shortly after it was produced, the cast was quietly cancelled due to his sudden unexpected move across country. Because sometimes life happens unexpectedly. As such, it sat on my computer, mostly unlistened to, until Rish commented that if I had a story kicking around that I'd like to send his way, he'd be happy to read it, and I realized that of course I had to send I Zombie to the Dune Steve. It's a story from the point of view of a dead person. That seems to be the only thing I ever submit to the Dune Steve. I don't know why that is. I swear I do write about other things, but yeah, point of view story about death, about a ghost, and now about a zombie. Mortality's a fixation of mine, so I suppose it's no surprise. I hope you enjoyed I Zombie, everyone, and I'm thrilled that people finally got the chance to hear it. Oh, okay, so there we go. That's the other story that uh, Munzee did for our show. It's the one from The Broken Mirror where the person calls and they only say one word, but it is enough. They all did that! Right, but I mean, that was his, like, the guy was a ghost who would had a heart attack and he wanted to tell his wife he was okay and by the time he finally learned how to flex his ghostly muscles and use the phone... Uh, she was over him, and when she answered, he's like, yeah, oh, well, I'm just going to fade away. I don't remember what that was called, but if any of y'all are long-time listeners, you might recognize it. Um, do you think we have any long-time listeners left? Or have they all totally jumped ship when it started sinking? We had one who rage quit the show today. Oh, crap. We'll, I'll come back to that in I a minute. I guess we will have to but, address uh, that. But yeah, my guess is we used to have people who we'd see their names over and over again in the comments. And uh, I think we'd, we would make reference to them on the show. And all of them are gone. <laughs> we don't get comments anymore. That If we do get any, they go to the forums. Forums are probably better, though. Because I mean, it's kind a better of, place for us. We've kind of moved it think? to that. What did you think of iZombie? Of, of here is what I wanted to say about it. Okay. First of all, I, I can't figure out who your reading of it reminded me of. I've been saying it's like a, a like platinum blonde, kind of older, wrinklier actor, British, and I can't think of his name, and I can't think of what he's been in, and therefore, if I could think of just one thing that he's been in. I'm sure you'd immediately know who I'm talking about because you have that kind of insanely remember everything uh, mind when it comes to movies. I wish I could think of it, but I totally can't. If anybody can think of what I'm talking about. But it was a, it was a kind of over the top reading for the whole time I was thinking this guy is a supervillain that you're doing like the monologue of a supervillain. It works. It totally works for the story. 
But I don't know. For some reason, you think zombie, so it's going to have to be like, which would have been unlistenable, I'm sure, if you had done something like that. Well, he's also so, so verbose, so eloquent right. as the zombie that I didn't feel like I could do, you know, even a like a growly way of telling this. It, it would just, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. It's just too weird. Yeah, he was very eloquent sounding and very like the Bond villain giving his uh, monologue right before he launches the missiles that are going to destroy the world. It's like Syndrome, except for Syndrome was less <laughs> fancy than the, than this zombie was. Uh, it made me wonder if this zombie was supposed to be British because, you know, he seemed pretty culture-y <laughs> and snooty. Would you say that it was that mid-Atlantic accent? Yeah, maybe. Maybe mid-Atlantic, somewhere in the middle. I like that term for some reason. Yeah, I kind of like it too. I mean, although you, you bring it up a lot, and maybe it's just because you know that it made an impact on me. Where it's like, mid-Atlantic? What the F? That was British. <laughs> yeah, did you remember that time when I sent you the article where someone was talking all about this mid-Atlantic accent that just how it totally went away in, like, the space of a generation. Oh, yeah, the, 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 in the old days, that's how movie, how actors were told to act in movies. And then it just, yeah, it went away with the advent of naturalized dialogue. And, and people stopped saying, really, I do. Oh, yikes. When you put it that way, <laughs> I don't think it went away fast enough. <laughs> Once Catherine Hepburn stopped acting and stuff, it went away. But yeah, and this isn't the first story that we've had that was told from the point of view of a zombie. Like, how do you tell a story from the point of view of a zombie? Well, what was the other one sides? By, yes. By Clayman Duggar. That's right. Clayman Luxury Yacht Duggar <laughs> was the author of the uh, other one I'm thinking pronounced? of. It's, uh, yeah. it's spelled claimant luxury yacht, but it's actually pronounced. That's right. It's actually pronounced uh, throat, throat wobbler, wobbler mangrove. <laughs> <laughs> that was the influence of Big Anklevich in my life that I know those Monty Python references. I don't actually watch Monty Python, but I do enjoy listening to him describe. <laughs> Monty Python sketches to me. Yeah, well, there was a time where we were watching through all the Flying Circus. I don't think we ever made it we to made, the end. I bet we made it through six episodes at most. That was back when we used to get together. Yeah, back when we used to watch things together, which we don't do unless it's in a theater. And even then, there have been many movies we just skipped this year. Well, the, I mean, there's less worth watching. Uh, pretty soon we're going to only be, like, reviewing fancy independent movies. Oh, where you have to drive 45 miles to right. find a theater Just, that's actually showing. Yeah, you have to go to the Tower Theater or the Broadway something or the... Yes. Something uh, with a with a different kind of name. So, uh, sorry, uh, let's go back screen. to Throat Warbler Mangrove. Okay. Clay Duggar wrote a, a zombie story called Sides and you say it was also from the point of view of of a zombie. Yeah, it's it's weird to tell a story from the point of view of a zombie because they're supposed to be mindless. This one certainly wasn't, though, in, in Munzee's. Definitely not, um, yeah. It like planned, and, and I think you had, you pointed out the moment when it stepped over the dead zombie. You're like, wow, I thought they could just shuffle. Yeah, and this one actually it, stepped over. It at least had to shuffle around the dead zombie. I mean, come on. And this one crept, <laughs> you know, silently creeping up on this person that was in the the convenience store wasn't a groaner you know there are different depictions of zombies in movies but yeah i, I to to find one that's this intellectual and and, and all that I, it, this is unique to me yeah i think he was probably a, a college professor before he was bitten before the world went to hell since when did and i've noticed this within like the last 10 years Zombie apocalypse has become the only apocalypse. It was a pretty fringe apocalypse back in the day, and you would have super flus, and you would have nuclear apocalypse. It was probably number one for a long time, but that one's kind of gone away, and now it's like, oh yeah, there's some disease, 
that has been released on the world or like global warming has gone to a point where it can't be reversed since you know turned the earth into a very untenable place or zombies but mostly zombies how did that happen is it just because like things like walking dead were so popular uh somebody made a zombie movie that was successful and then somebody else made a zombie movie that was successful and for the most part they tended to be cheap I mean, yeah, you can make a, world, a movie like World War Z that costs one hundred and eighty million dollars, but most of them don't, and that's part of why. Like, uh, Twenty Eight Days Later was cheap as hell to make, and you know how they um, did the effect of a, a desolate London where the population had been wiped out. They shot early in the morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, continue. <sir. laughs> Maybe it's Resident Evil. Wasn't that a game before it was a? It was a successful video game series, and then was it always a fairly about successful? It was right. Yeah, it was, I think it was a, a first-person shooter. Wow. I remember Rob in college, like joking about Resident Evil and just how lame it was. We're like, I hope that's not Kevin's blood. You know, that was like the way the lines were delivered, or something like that. I never played it. I'm not much of a gamer. I know that destroys my nerd cred or sorry geek cred that's right nerds are smart <laughs> nobody thinks i have that kind of cred <laughs> but yeah i'm not really much of a gamer so i never played but i wonder if that could be the kickoff because it was really successful yeah oh there are myriad zombie video games i mean just tons and tons you know the, the last of us or dead rising or you know uh, just i guess it was successful once, and everybody does it. I mean, there are Call of Duty games where instead of, you know, brown people, you're shooting zombies. and It's a whole subgenre of video games. And, yeah, maybe adapting that to films. So yeah, there was a House of the Dead video game that they made a movie of. There was an Alone in the Dark video game that they made a movie of. But you make Resident Evil, and it hits. Then well, you make four more of those, or five more of those. Yeah, I'm not saying that the movie itself was what kicked things off mm -hmm. but the game kicked it off and then they start oh, okay. oh let's make a movie and they got 28 days later they're like hey they make money with zombie movies let's make resident evil a movie and then yeah pretty soon they're making zombie land and they're making all sorts there's there you know the funny thing we've got this story here called i zombie there's a tv show called i zombie yeah it's on after the flash and sadly I will always catch the preview for it or the first Previously 30 seconds. Previously on iZombie? Because... She's like a zombie detective or something, right? She works in a morgue and she eats the brains of these people that come into the morgue and then she's able to see what killed them, read their minds, sort of like relive their last moments and so she solves the crimes of the people. Oh, God, she's got the worst accent <laughs> in real life. She does this American accent. But yeah, they... I, that show doesn't appeal to me at all. Have you ever watched it? I have not. It was. It's a DC show, though, apparently. It comes from, like, a DC comic book or something you like that. You told me that, and I just didn't believe you. <laughs> well, we went to a panel at a Comic-Con where they're like, let's discuss DC television. And that was one of the shows they discussed, and I was, I, I was disgusted when they did. <laughs> Again, uh, you told me this story. I didn't believe you. You were in the panel with me. I know, but I you were sitting next to me. Mentioned I Zombie. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay, so you were bringing up that there's a TV show called I Zombie. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I guess that's just another one of the the things. I mean, obviously, the most successful thing that goes along with all of that stuff is uh, got to be The Walking Dead, which made it big as a comic book and then became a TV show and made it huge. And, like, everybody, even all sorts of non-nerds love that. So, dang, yeah, non-geeks. Norm, normal people. I'm totally people. mixing this up. <laughs> the normies watch right. Walking Dead. I mean, it's, yeah, it's I, I, I go to San Diego Comic-Con every year, and, yeah, they're the superhero movies, which should be the big draw. And then there's Walking Dead, which is like, oh, dude, F the superhero movies. It's Walking Dead time. I You and I tried to get into it, and... I don't know what happened, why we abandoned it. I guess the same reason we don't get together and watch anything. <laughs> well, what, re what the real problem was, we'd watched like the first five episodes of six. Yeah, there were only six. Were like the original season. 
And the sixth episode, uh, I, I guess it was preview month, and I got the first six episodes, or the first five episodes, sorry, from A and E on a preview, and then A and E went away, and I didn't have it on cable Isn't anymore. Is that AMC? Maybe it is. Maybe it's AMC. I don't know. Whatever. I, I thought it was A and E, but I guess it could be AMC. American Movie Classics, isn't that oh, what AMC is? Sorry, but A and E is Arts and Entertainment. Yeah, well, TLC is the learning channel, so the, the, the and yeah, things... they only show shitty reality. Yeah, shows. Yeah, reality TLC. home improvement shows, and say yes to the dress and stuff like Wait, that. Wait, what's say yes to the dress? Is it a bride show? Yes, it's about the amazing journey of a woman buying her bridal gown. Really? Yes. People show. It's all about this bridal shop. People show up at the bridal shop and they like. And I can't believe uh, that one has a pleat here, and, and oh, the lace is not as frilly as I want, and yeah. The worst is like half of them like can't even decide, and they just leave. Oh. And people will fly out. It's a shop in New York. They'll fly there from somewhere else just to go to this shop and check out a gown, and then they'll leave without one. And the gowns also cost more than a car. Part of Munzee's story was about the fall of society, you know, how we had the chance to fix things and if we had done it early bickered. enough. But instead, yeah, we just let our petty grievances and differences and mistrust and paranoia allow ourselves to be destroyed. And if you want to see any other scenario of humanity at its worst, <laughs> it's a, a woman preparing for her wedding day. <laughs> So half a dozen in one hand, six in the other. Yeah, I, I might have to agree with that. At the risk of offending all of our female listeners. Or queen. I, uh... <laughs> well, see, you should disagree so that nobody rage quits the show. Oh, okay. No, I totally disagree. So we've got a fair and balanced There, There may panel. be one or two bridezillas out there, but most of them are completely level-headed and they're they're doing things the right way. No, you don't understand. This is about me. This is my day. <laughs> that was... Big, that was really offensive, that voice you just did. I, I'm, I'm upset that you would do that. Mm-hmm. This was short. This was easy to get out there. Only had one narrator, uh, or sorry, one voice person on there. Had the lovely Kevin McLeod doing the music as usual. Yeah, uh, I never even saw this story until it was completely complete. Well, it was during that period where we just didn't have any shows. And like, and we're not going to have any shows for several weeks or months. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, I'll jump on the horn and do this all myself. And then, yeah, I don't know what happened. Weeks and months passed. Yeah, somehow it languished. But we got another episode done, and we're nearly we were nearly through it, folks. Yeah. So if you made it this far, you've made it almost through another episode of the Newton Steve. If you've enjoyed it half as much as we've enjoyed making it, we've enjoyed it twice as much as you. Okay. My day. You know, up there it's their time. Down here it's our time. <laughs> it's our time. Down here. Down here, yeah. Up there it's their time. Up there. When George Romero created the zombie, he uh, used it as like a, a way of commenting on society, on, on the, the ills of society, on the worst aspects of human beings. And uh, I mean, you know, it doesn't always get used that way, but you'll find that, uh, that sometimes you can still see those parallels of, you know what, I think this is really about. Right. And I, I like that about science fiction or and horror and fantasy where you can sort of shroud the point you're trying to make you know you've got a soapbox but if you put a speculative fiction bent on that soapbox people don't get as upset there's a distance from it because you're like no 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 this is a different planet yeah. where people hate other people because of the color of their skin yeah right yeah this is we're not saying you guys are racist no there's aliens that are racist uh, yeah, there's that's that's one of the reasons I think that zombies have have persisted, and I, we probably talked about this when Clay Duggar did his episode. But it's also us; they're us. They're a reminder of what we are going to become. And unless you're absolutely delusional, there's that fear that one day you're going to die in the back of your head. You know what I mean? 
Uh-huh. It's out there. There's everybody's got an expiration date. There's a bullet with your name on it to bring up yet yeah, another quote that we do on the show all the time. <laughs> and it's it's scary. It's unsettling. It's the sort of thing that occurs to you in the middle of the night when you should be sleeping. A zombie is a reminder of that. It's walking around reminding you that this is your destiny. This is your final destination. And that's another reason why zombies are scary. And relevant. And, and you know, that constantly coming back. It's just that, that kind of thing. All right. So is there more that you wanted to say about the story? Do you, is, do you have anything to say about the story? Or the... Uh, I'm, I'm done with comments about the story, but I did have another thing that I wanted to address. Okay. Is it the elephant in the room? Uh, no, that, that's just my elephant that I got last week. It's it, My kids really like pets, and we've gone through a bunch of them, and that's just the most recent one. Yeah, that, that won't end in disaster at all. No, I, I'm sure it'll be in the pound in a week, but uh, for now, do you think pounds take elephants? I wouldn't think so. Mm. But, well, we'll find out. Well, maybe it'll be in the circus then. Anyways, the last time we did an episode, it was an unusual episode. It was not our normal thing. Uh, we did two episodes in a row, one where we kind of talked about an idea and asked people to submit their ideas for that idea. Their takes on that idea, sure. Okay, that's a better way to say it without using the word idea a hundred times. And a lot of people sent them in, and we were pretty stoked about that, and we thought that was pretty neat. And we tried to make sure we got everybody, including the one that came in just through the wire. <laughs> Don't um, go there. Uh, we and did it was that one. Delightful having to record all of that more than once. Yeah, we got to do it a bunch of times because uh, that's just the way things go for us because we're cursed. Ever since we picked up that little Hawaiian tiki statue that we found, it was a Zuni fetish doll, I believe. Oh, is that what it was? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. It was the I'm not as well versed in those tiki things. Tiki idol, right? Yeah. It makes that sound. Every time you, it's weird because every time you grab it, it makes that sound. <laughs> which I don't know. I, there must be like batteries and a little I speaker in it. I thought that was your ringtone. Like, it's like, they just got a text again. It's just <laughs> funny. But somebody contacts him every time he picks that thing. You know, we've tried to get rid of the damn tiki statue and we throw it out every time we're driving, but somehow it's back in the car every time. So I don't know what's up with that. But, anyways, so yeah, cursed. A part of that curse is that we uh, keep killing off all our listeners by causing them to rage quit. And one of our favorite listeners is uh, Senor Marshall Latham. Although I believe, since it's a Hispanic name, you say Marshall Latham. I don't think there's a TH sound in, in Spanish. Oh, but... you just say Latham? Yes, you Okay, do. sorry, I'm, I'm less versed in Spanish. No, that's all right. Um, yeah, he was a he was actually a friend of ours, not just a friend of the show. Yeah, he actually came to my house once, and I refused to let him in, but it was neat. Well, you had I young, had... impressionable children. Yeah. I, I kind of understand. Yeah, and, I mean, it was cool to have a stalker, but, uh, you know, now he's not stalking anymore. I mean, I lost my stalker. That's how sad life has become. Um, Don't know what you got. Till it's gone. Yeah, uh, Marshall, Cinderella, ladies and gentlemen, give him a hand. Moving down three notches this week on the uh, heavy metal edition of Casey Stop. What, what would Cinderella be? I don't think they count as heavy metal. I don't know. If, I don't know what they call it. I mean, uh, the thing I've heard most often described as is hair bands. That's not a thing. Or that's uh, a pejorative. These, that's something it is somebody pejorative. came up with afterward. I think they were saying it already at the time. The thing that they came up with afterwards is butt rock. That, and that's worse than pejorative. Which, okay. Because, yeah, I don't, I'm not a fan of that, too. That, that's what people say that hate that kind of music. Someone like you. Like, a, yeah, a, a social... Wait, I don't hate you can't butt say rock that, at all. You can't say that word on the podcast. What? We can't lose Marshall a second time. He was... God, he was a real friend. I mean, beyond just a listener, he produced episodes for us, he did voices for us, and he attended the New Media Expo with us, and all these things. He invited and us to his hotel room one time. He did. That was, again, a little stalkery, but, you know, cool. It's that just, I will cut out if you want me to. <laughs> it's just kind of a shame to see Marshall uh, rage quit on us like that. But he sent us an idea... For the B story, 
and it was just in a different place. We found them kind of all over the place. Most of them came through the email, the correct email, the not submissions email, although one of them did come through the submissions email. Yeah, some people send them to me directly. So it's like, okay, uh, all right, I got them that way. Yeah, so, you know, we got them in all sorts of different ways, but Marsha just plays on the forum, and we missed that one. But we figured since we could, we'd go ahead and, uh, and, and read his as well and discuss it. So it's sort of like an addendum to the, uh, the last episode, and what the hell? So, sorry, you would call it what? What, that genre? If, okay, if, if Cinderella is not heavy metal, would they be hard rock? Yeah, you could call them that. They had a term that they would call glam rock, which was the kind of bands like Poison and Cinderella Motley and Motley Crue that were... Where men wore makeup. Yeah, they had makeup. They were really heavy on the hairspray. But was that a pejorative? I don't think so. Or did I, I use that word too much? Did I stop using it? Okay, if here on out, I'm not going to use that word anymore. Okay, because, yeah, I'll totally unfriend I don't you want you to unfriend me. I don't think it was a pejorative. Hey, hey, please, don't. I, I think no I actually heard a band use the term in their song. I don't know. I, I have no idea. I can't, you know, it's like alternative. Where did that term come from? And it seems like rock has gone away and alternative is the only thing left. And how can it be an alternative if it's the only thing? Whatever. Marshall sent us a thing. And if any of you guys know Marshall, please, you know, send him an email. Tell him we love him. We Tell want him we're him sorry. Back. Please don't hate us, Marshall. Here's your idea. We love you. No one else can make me feel the colors that you bring. Okay, so here's Marshall's idea. It says, My B story idea kind of loosely tracks the premise of Bradbury's Zero Hour. The child becomes petrified of bees for no apparent reason, and the parents do their best to console him slash her. But they just pass it off as a phase of irrational fear. After a week or so of this, the son or daughter, let's just go with daughter, does an about face and loves bees. Can't wait to go out and play with bees. She claims she can talk to them and says things like, I was silly to be afraid of bees. The bees are so fun and they are smart too. Did you know that bees can add different biochemicals to the pollen and make all kinds of different things like nerve agents and hallucinogens and even explosives? The parents are somewhat surprised by what she says, but pretty much brush it off as childish nonsense. Because most kids know about things like hallucinogens and nerve agents. And they just joke around and talk about them all the time. They feel good that she has found a way to cope with her fear. It must be those silly video games she plays on her iPod. <laughs> but the kid doesn't play video games anymore, or any kind of game, or sports, or much of anything she used to do. She doesn't eat much anymore either, and she becomes obsessed with staying outside with the bees. She starts to sneak out at night, and doesn't come home for dinner, and such. One night... Her mom confronts her and discovers track marks on her arms and the underside of her knees. What's the meaning of this, says dad. It's the bees, daddy. It's how they teach me things. Well, the parents have had enough of this and decide to lock her in the laundry room where there are no windows. The girl pleads with them to let her out. At first, out of anger, and for her own freedom, her parents are distraught. What are they going to do? The girl's cries grow weak. But then she says, you don't understand, they'll kill you. Then she falls asleep. I don't understand. What do you think she means by that? Obviously, she's addicted to some kind of drugs. She doesn't know what she's saying. 
How does this happen? She's only eight years old. We'll take her to a counselor tomorrow or, or a rehab for kids. Do you think it has something to do with the bees? Don't be ridiculous. You know, the typical 80s movie set up or, or for what's to come next. That night, a massive swarm of bees assaults the house. They work their way in every crack and crevice. In some places, the walls seem to corrode with some kind of acid. Maybe throw in some beeswax Molotov cocktails. The parents don't stand a chance. They are stung on every part of their bodies, possibly suffocated by the bees crawling into their nose and mouth. When it's over, the swarm almost carries the sobbing girl out of the house while she is sad that her parents were killed, she's exhilarated to be reunited with the bees. Days later, she's quoted as saying, I will miss them, but they just don't understand what it meant to be part of the hive. Most adults don't understand, but they couldn't stop us. Nothing can stop us now. Swarm, swarm, swarm. Wait, what? <laughs> Did he actually write Swarm, Swarm, Swarm? <laughs> no, that was me. Sorry. Oh. I was embellishing. I'm sorry. If this were a movie, the camera would slowly pan out from a close-up of her eyes, which are now completely black and taking on an insect-like appearance. As it continues to expand, we see bees crawling all over her, but not so many that she's completely covered. We then see that she's surrounded by other children from the neighborhood, all in the same state. The neighborhood shows signs of more houses being damaged, with a few fires burning here and there. A single bee lands on the camera lens and crawls around, then a swarm approaches, and we fade to black as the camera lens is completely covered with bees. And all we hear is the sound of bees buzzing. Sorry that turned into more of a screenplay at the end, but it's how I pictured it. Anyway, there you go. That's my B story. Too bad he didn't send us his A story. <laughs> Gosh. Seriously, how come we don't rate that? Those go to the Escape Artists podcast. <laughs> yeah, yes they do. That was disturbing, dude. I'm kind of glad he uh, decided to rage quit, to rage quit away. the show. Yeah, yeah. we're probably better off without Marshall. I don't know. That one if seems... you know Marshall, don't say anything to him. Just let him fade away because I'm freaked out now. I don't know. That's more unsettling than the others, I think. Yeah. See, Ew, that she became a bee kind of thing, too. <laughs> is that, can you imagine? Has, have they, has anybody ever done that in a movie? Became Where, a bee. Uh, yeah, like a Swarm child. Their, became a their bee. Their eyes are replaced by the multifaceted insect eyes. That's the fly. It wasn't a bee, but it was an insect. Eyes. Well, but that was just an insect head on on a human body. Anyway, uh, that that visual is really disturbing to me. Hmm. But not you. You love it. I do love it. That's what Swarm did in that Spider-Man cartoon. He would turn people into bees. That's true, you told me that. people. And I had no memory of that, but maybe that's why it's upset me for so long. <laughs> yeah, about 1992, I wrote a story where somebody turned into a bee person. And I drew a picture where I took a friend of mine, a girl, and I, I drew her, and then I replaced her eyes with bee eyes. And then coming out of her mouth was one of those... Is it like a proboscis? proboscis? Yeah, exactly. Those long, loopy, disgusting things. And I was like, I've got to destroy this. This is an evil, <laughs> evil thing that I've done. It really upset me on some weird subconscious level. And maybe it all goes back to swarm. Swarm. Yeah, we ran a story on the show a long time ago. Called, called My Simantha? The Kingdom of the Flies. Oh, okay. Which had a similar ending to this, you know, the... the the flies come to punish someone, and they swarm into the house from all cracks and crevices. That, that totally is what I was thinking when I was seeing this. And that was a good idea, Marshall. I really liked it. I think you ought to turn it all the way into a story. That sounds fun. You could make it 
your Poe story for the year? Sure, Poe did. He did a story called Goldbug, so there you go. You could call this the gold bug. And it's all about bees, because they're gold and black. <laughs> I think you're stretching. But, I, I, yeah, I feel bad that we didn't get this one in the last episode. A, the last episode was insanely long. As opposed to all our other episodes that are nice and short. This one was supposed to be nice and short. But, yeah, I, I really liked that one. Yeah, that was good. Um, again, if you know Marshall, let him know that uh, we, we remembered him fondly. Yeah. Uh, there was another thing that we actually meant to do in the last episode that we never got around to. Was it ask for donations? Guys, we really could appreci- We really could use your donations. No, no, just that, click actually, right on the top. that actually wasn't what I was going to say. I mean, people could donate if they want, but there, it was something else. Okay, what, what was that? Um, well, we had an idea sent to us from Senor, I believe, since it's a Spanish name, is Nubili Red. Is that that's Spanish, right? Nobilis Street. Sorry, I'm not very well versed in Spanish, so I sometimes I pronounce it wrong. How would you say it in dirty, dirty Brazilian? Because they'd put it like a vowel at the end, right? But yeah, it would probably be Nobilis, something like that. Redu- but you would say Reedy. Reedy! <laughs> that ain't cool, man. And, uh, Didn't you want me to cut all that out? The, the terrible Spanish joke? The Portuguese and the... That, yeah, that stuff you can cut out, but I just assumed the other... Before we got to that, before you say How would you say that in Dirty Brazilian? <laughs> you reminded me that I insulted your language. <laughs> okay, so yeah, yeah. Uh, Nobilis sent us a thing, and we listened to his idea, but also he had... Uh, Suggestion for the show. Okay, thank you. I keep using the word idea again and again and again, and it's killing me. I read a story once about ideas that were killing you, guy. Yeah? If you didn't write them, then they would just punish the crap out of you. Yeah. What a shit story. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's let's listen to this suggestion that uh, Nobil has had for us. I think it would be interesting to have a kind of a a chain story where people send in bits of story to one episode and there's like a, an overarching title so that people can say okay this is you know the story of the bees chapter one and then somebody else says okay i'm going to send in the story of the bees chapter two and let's say you get two or three of those you pick the one you like best and you put that one in the podcast and this is this is story of the bees chapter two and then people can go in and, and put a, another bit on that and if you wanted to, you could have the in, the people who are contributing to these things be sending in some kind of like reports from the field of various events in different places and times happening to different people that kind of advance the story and also you know follow along with some with the themes and what have you, and just see where it goes. You may recall many years ago, I did a uh, podcast novel kind of this way called Pieces. It's still up on patiobooks.com if somebody wants to go hunt it down. And I basically had a dozen different authors submit their bit of a story and then, then the next person would go on from there, the next person from there, the next person from there. And it was it was a lot of fun. I did the very first and the very last chapters. It was incoherent in some ways, and it was fun in others. And this sounds like something that uh, the Dune Steve listeners might be up for. So anyways, that's my idea, and my idea. And uh, I hope that something good comes from this, because I can't imagine the Dune Steve listeners aren't interesting people. Thanks for all the good work. Nobilis Reed, signing out. All right, so that was uh, Nobilis's suggestion for us the idea of making a story that's kind of passed along from one person to the next to the next it could be an interesting thing it could be fun is that one of those things that you ever did like in high school or grade school or whenever it was that people did that or it'd be like let's write a story each person writes one sentence or one word or one something insanely small and silly and uh, then, then there's always the the one jerk in there too that doesn't even try and just makes it like the hardest thing. And then you're always the person that's next after that guy, so you have to come up with something 
No, I was that jerk. Oh, that you was were right before you. Oh, okay. That set it up. Yeah. So. You were the saboteur that would leave me going. Uh, 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 yeah, it was just and the his... girl that I was hoping to impress. Was like, wow, it's, you can't even. He's the worst person I've ever met. I'm leaving this party now. And his story battle of the ideas sucked. <laughs> yes. Sorry. <laughs> that was a, what we call in the business a callback to 30 seconds ago. <laughs> yes, yes, we did do that. And I, I remember doing it in like a high school English class. or cre- I don't think there were creative writing classes in, in high school, but, you know, one of those where, yeah, you just pass it on and then you have to write the next. It, it was always something small. It was never as big as a chapter. It might not even have been a, a paragraph. It was a sentence and then you go on and you're trying to make a story that way. But I always found it ended really badly. It was always disastrous to try and do that writing as com- as a committee or as a... What do you call the Henry Ford assembly, assembly, line. assembly line kind of thing? Yeah, It's like that game where you whisper in somebody's ear Telephone. the phrase. Right? And yeah, and then the next person whispers and whispers and then by the time it comes around to the other end, it's completely awful. Although it's not really like that game at all, so... Forget I ever mentioned it. <laughs> the problem with telephone. it does suck, anyways. In the end, what comes out sucks. Okay. And usually, the story that comes out when you each write a sentence tends to suck too. And you're just like, "Wow, I wish I had the thirty seconds it took me to read that paragraph back." <laughs> but no, Billis made it sound like his experience was a positive. Yeah, it definitely sounded like it worked. He put it on audio books and stuff, right? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Do you remember Potty of Books? Oh, never mind. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's not let's reopen not that there. wound. No. Let's I, not scratch that the scab The first off. time we did this episode, I remember <laughs> us talking about wasted time trying to get our stuff on Potty of Books. I guess that could work. Like, if you all, if you went on a writer's retreat, and there were like four of you or six of you, and you had to write a story in this way, in a, not as a committee, but as an assembly line, let's call mm-hmm. it that. Yeah, as long as you are not trying to sabotage the story or whatever and make it super, super hard for the next person or or, or what I would do, which would be try and make it funny when it wasn't supposed to be, which would also sabotage the story. Right, yeah. I mean, you would get get somebody's like, I'm going to write a romance. And the next person's like, no, I'm writing an adventure story. And the next person's like, I want a sci-fi story. And then it comes to me and it's like, I want to write about bots. (laughs) Hee hee hee. And yeah, then I have to miss the end of the story because I'm in the principal's office. I don't know. I, I, in a way, I kind of want to try it because it sounded like it worked for him. But in another way, I was like, oh, geez, yeah, I, it just I brings write back... so little anyway. <laughs> it brings back the, the experience from high school where I'm just like, oh, yeah, that didn't, I guess it's probably more like grade school. But anyways, I don't have fond memories. Maybe we'll have to consider it. Maybe we'll have to go and listen to Nobilis's his, his Podio book. Right. And maybe we can listen to him and go, well, wow, well, I guess it can possibly turn out right. But in that scenario, do you have somebody who's sort of the leader who's not controlling but is sort of steering the story toward a certain place? You know, like, do we all start with, okay, this is the premise, and here's sort of the beginning, middle, and end. So we all know where we're going. We can kind of work in that way. Or is it more fun if you have no idea where you're going and it's like, okay, and this guy just took it off the rails and now I have to either decide to keep it going where he's going or try and bring it back. Or to say he woke up from a dream and then just come <laughs> And the back last to it. several pages had all been in his mind. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like you would need that. Or at the very least, you would have to select the people ahead of time and be like, okay, this person, this person, this person, this person. And, you know, they're committed to something cool. And we'll go with that. I don't know. I don't know how that would work. Well, what I do know was, until we had to redo it, this is the fifth time, right? (laughs) The B story thing, I thought was really successful. I was impressed by how many people were passionate about it, or willing at least, to send in their take. And, uh, yeah, the disaster of, of, of how it all turned out, and then losing Marshall as a friend made it not as cool but there was still the seed for audience participation bringing us something that we never would have come up with on our own 
that I really like. And so, yeah, I could see it working again in that way where somebody says, oh, oh, oh I've got the next part. And yeah, they put their heart and soul into it. And you're like, wow, OK, well, who's next? It's possible that it could work out, I suppose. Um, we'll have to we'll have to ponder it. And, and you know, if you what you tell us what you guys think of this in the comments. Definitely do. Yeah. Or in the forums, not in the submissions folder. Yeah. But yeah, the last time we recorded this episode, we talked a tiny bit about the one time that you and I tried to create a story just on our own while we were re recording. We or we were we were driving back from the New Media Expo and we tried to just come up with a story. Of, yeah, we just pitched an idea and, and just worked it. We workshopped it. And I always felt bad that it didn't work better, that it wasn't more successful because I thought, oh, we'll, we'll do this like every six months. We'll do this every year. And we never did it again. We never went to do Media Expo again might be the reason why. <laughs> we do very little if, together. If we had we a long out. drive, we might be able to do that again. Oh, I'd like to do that very much. Or we could go, we could drive up to Idaho and try and convince Marshall to take us back. Yeah, there you go. I think he's still in Oregon. Oh, Susan, that would have been a, yeah, it would, a, bad, a wasted trip. It's been a long drive for a lot of nothing. Um, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe we got, got some good podcasting done. <laughs> <laughs> it was some kind of a long drive. I'd like to do that. It was fun. I, I like to just throw crap like that around. It's hard to collaborate for some reason for the two of us. I think we're we're like the set in the, our ways people that, you know, we're the odd couple that I have to be this way and you have to be that way and then you make us live together. It's just like, ah, can't stand you. I'm going to put the tape here. This is my side of the room. I'm going to put all my junk on the floor if I want to and you better not try and clean it up. For some reason, that's the way we seem to go. Like, you're like, oh, I have this idea about this. And it's, oh, that's cool. Well, here's my contribution to that idea. You're like, oh, that wasn't my contribution, so I don't want it. The end. And that's how <laughs> that's how our things seem to go. And it seems like we need a completely original thing to start with, or else it's never going to work. So maybe we can manage to make something work if we can do that. Well, I, what do you mean by completely original? I mean, how would we do this? I mean, something that we haven't already tossed around in our mind at all beforehand. You know what I'm saying? It's not a, oh, I had this idea the other day about a guy who does this and he does this and he does this. Oh, like on the spur of the moment, yes. we come up with it. We're just like, yeah. okay, what, uh, and, boy or girl? And, girl. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, she is like where? Uh, on the beach. Okay. Why is she on the beach? That kind of thing? Yeah, something like that. Uh, I remember once in college, I went to a thing where Orson Scott Card was speaking. He would do this thing where he would take a an article from the newspaper and he'd be like, okay, how can we make this into a story? And he'd read the article and then they would, he would just go from there and try and create a story. He's like, you can write a story about anything. And then they picked an article and they came up with an idea and it was shit. So <laughs> it doesn't always work, but. <laughs> Maybe we could make it work, but it'd be fun to try. Maybe that could be a that gets my goat headed your way in the future. Well, it couldn't hurt to try. Yeah, I feel like we've gone all over on this episode. We've talked about several things, but that's cool. We got another episode all done. And as far as I can tell, it's still recording. So that would be a big change. M miracles. That's enough of a miracle to apply for sainthood. You think it'll work? So thanks for listening, folks, to another episode. I hope you enjoyed the story. Thanks, Munzee, for sending it to letting us you for letting us use it. Thanks to Rish Outfield for narrating and putting it together uh, and making sure that we had a story in our dry spell. And uh, thanks to Marshall for giving us an idea that we missed and we're sorry. Please take us back. Loving you Thanks It's <laughs> easy cause you're beautiful And thanks to uh, Nobilis for that little suggestion that we uh, just kicked around there for a few minutes that was, uh, that was a lot of fun Thanks to everybody Thanks to Announcer Man for announcing all the stuff including that really boring legalese thing that we do at the end every time 
Who knows even why? Because nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. He tries to make it not boring. He does, yeah. And he's he's amazing, dude. This an announcer man, there's no announcer that holds a candle to him. Or a pipe. Definitely not that. What a stand-up guy. Uh, thanks to Oedo T for... What? For being dead and not editing anything out. <laughs> you have no idea, listener, how many times Big has brought up the subject of resurrecting Oedo T. I love Oedo T. I want <laughs> him back. It keeps not happening. I want you back. Bam, now, now, now. The Drone Steve is produced under a cre- Oh, I thought you were going to make the music and I would. Ah, good night, folks. This has been Rich Outfield. And Big Anklevich. Ciao, you, baby. See you soon. Ciao, baby. That's Spanish, right? I, I'm not very good with the Spanish, but I'm pretty sure. I believe it's a cult song. Good night. That brings us to the end of the show. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Wow, today's show sucks more than a Shakespeare monologue delivered by Vin Diesel. Take two. Speaking of which, the, the zombie walk was yesterday. Oh, it was yesterday? I thought it was next week. Yeah, I asked the kids if they wanted to go this year or if we should just skip it. And they just did this. Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. They, yes, hand they, gesture. They made the masturbatory hand gesture. Nobody makes that hand gesture anymore. That's that's, that's only our generation. Who was it that would make the gesture and actually finish? You remember? I don't know. It would make the gesture and then it would like he would have it like the gesture and then go. Ugh, ugh. Yeah, it would. Who? Because it was you. I thought that told me about somebody that would do that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, really? That because yeah, doing this is is kind of vulgar, but doing the it to completion. Oh my goodness. Sorry, uh, we'll have to cut all that. Yeah, out that's cause... out to end of the show, folks. If you want to hear this, it's at the end. <laughs> okay, just skip. After all the music and the legalese, all that crap, that's where you'll find this. <laughs> yes, because they listen through to hear it, guys. Oh, that's oh. right. That doesn't really help, does it? I apologize if this was my fault, the whole thing. Does that terrible idea sound familiar? <laughs> so that's uh, where we're headed, eh? No, just me. You go ahead. I... Shall we wait for the uh, helicopter to again pass over? What was that? Boys are beating off again. Hope that the writer of that particular story isn't upset. Is that where you were going? No, I wasn't going to say that. But I don't know what I was going to say. That's why I quit. Did you rage quit? Yeah. What should, what should I play under that? <laughs> I don't know. The, the song that I was actually thinking in my mind right then was... <laughs> that... Um... Sorry, that... How does that song that go? That didn't help me at all. That, oh. Well, that's a romantic song, isn't it? No, but that would be fine. What? Loving you is easy because you're beautiful. beautiful. Can we do it? Do, 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 do. Ah. It's okay. Maya Rudolph's mother singing that song. Oh, shit story. <laughs> Do I cut that out? I leave in that was a shit story. <laughs> you can. It was my story, so I can insult it I all I want. I know, and I feel a little bit bad about that. <laughs> Some guy said your story was cack. Hey, was that good? <laughs> yeah, I shaved my cack. <laughs> Here's my own anecdote against me, spirit. Well, I guess I'm, I, I'm going to become a cat lover then, because... <laughs> Because you're always petting human scrotal skin. <laughs> well, we, we, everybody has their thing. <laughs> Stay. Bark, bark, wag tail. Good boy. Good boy. Uh, really, Big? Seriously?